Hi, and welcome to the workshop. In this disc, we're going to be discussing modifiers, which is the newest feature we've added to ProShow Producer, and a feature that's used to create incredibly gorgeous slide effects with relative ease compared to the way that these effects would need to be created in the past. Now, to get started, we first have to understand exactly what a modifier is. So here's your definition, and it's very simple and very straightforward. A modifier is very simply a change to a value that's applied within certain constraints. This change can apply to just about any value that you find in the effects or caption motion settings. These are values that work directly with keyframing. So for example, a modifier could be applied to your pan position by simply adding a modifier. This allows you to make a change to the value in addition to whatever the value setting may be. And as I said previously, that change can be made with certain constraints. So essentially creating a modifier is designing the change that you want to make to a value and then adjusting the constraints that you want to use to configure how that value is applied. And it should be noted that this value is made in addition to the normal value of whatever your particular layer or caption may be using. So remember the very straightforward definition for a modifier. And that is, it's simply a value that changes a setting. Very simple. Now, modifiers are designed to be used to create things that would normally be done with keyframes, but would be otherwise very difficult or impossible to do if you were using keyframes. And that includes things like these two examples taken from our Style Pack 2. Here we can see a title slide that has multiple image layers working in coordination with one another to pan into position. This kind of perfect coordination can be done with the use of keyframes, but is made much easier with modifiers. Our second example that you see here was also created with modifiers to control the motion of the layers and create the speed line effects that you see taking place there. Now, it's important to remember that while modifiers are incredibly powerful, it is also the most complex effect that we've put into Producer. Now, once you begin to understand how it works and how it can be used, the method of employing modifiers should become like second nature to you. But do keep in mind that this disk is intended for advanced users, those who are already familiar with how to use keyframes, masking, and other advanced features within Producer. And that's because all of those features are used to enhance modifiers, such as what you see here midway through our speed lines. This is created by changing the proportions of an image layer within certain set constraints dictated by a modifier on the position and zoom values of the image layer. So modifiers will make your advanced effects far more straightforward and even add a certain level of automation as you'll discover when we begin looking at more concrete examples. But it is important to note that while modifiers are powerful, they do operate within limits. For the most part, a modifier cannot create an effect that couldn't otherwise be done with keyframes. So it's important to keep in mind that both of the examples you see here could be made with the use of keyframes. The major difference is that modifiers make this kind of an effect much easier to assemble and much more accurate, including automatically adjusting to changes that you may make to the layout of your slide. So remember that modifiers are very powerful, that modifiers are typically used to replace what would otherwise be done with keyframing, and that modifiers still work within certain limitations. That is, they make keyframing effects much easier to do, but they're not going to open an entire new library of effects that you couldn't otherwise do without modifiers. And of course, remember that very important definition to the modifier itself. And that is, a modifier is just some change that's applied to a value within certain constraints. Now, with that said, we're going to move on to Chapter 2, which is where we'll look in detail at the modifier interface, how you can begin creating and working with modifiers of your own.
And now we move on to chapter two, where we begin the actual look at your modifier interface, exactly where they can be used, and what process you follow to create modifiers of your own. Now to begin, we need a slide to work with, so simply select an image and drag it into your slide list to create a new slide. The important thing to remember about modifiers is that they can be created at any time and they can be used with any effects value. Now, let's take a look at exactly where you can apply modifiers before we get started with the modifier interface. In the slide options, we have three areas that can be used with modifiers. This is motion effects, adjustment effects, and finally, in the caption category, caption motion. Now, what it's important to note is that all of these areas have something in common, and that is keyframing. Modifiers are designed to augment and work with your keyframe settings. So that means you won't find them other than those areas where you configure and interact with keyframes. Now that said, a modifier can be added to any value that changes along with your keyframe settings. So for example, any of the pan, zoom, rotate, or rotation center values can have modifiers applied to them and that can be done on individual keyframes or multiple pairs of keyframes. The same holds true for adjustment effects. In the adjustment effects section, you'll find that you can apply modifiers to colorization, opacity, all the way down the list through blur. For caption motion, you'll find that you can apply modifiers to the font size, to the font color, the position, rotation, character rotation, skew, and opacity values of your captions. So note that the only two settings that cannot be used with modifiers are smoothing under caption motion and smoothing under motion effects. Every other option can be used with a modifier. Now with that said, let's take a look at the modifier interface itself and how you go about creating them. To begin, you need to select a value that you want to add a modifier to. So in this case, let's start with something simple and predictable. We'll begin with the pan x value. Now if you recall, the pan x value controls the horizontal position of your layer. That is, where it's located to the left or to the right of your slide frame. To begin, to begin creating a modifier, simply right click on the value that you wish to modify, and you'll find an option at the bottom of the flyout menu that says add modifier. Selecting Add Modifier takes us into the Modifier interface. And this is where you can go about the task of creating and configuring exactly what your modifier is going to do. Now let's take a look at the interface in detail. To begin in the upper left hand corner, notice that we have a modifier target. This is the value that we're going to add a modifier to. This means that you're always able to double check and verify that you're modifying the value you intended to adjust. Here we can see that it's telling us we're going to add a modifier to the pan x value of layer 1, followed by the name of that layer. Now, just beneath the modifier target, we have the apply to. This is the keyframes that we want to apply the modifier to. We can select all keyframes, or we can choose a specific range of keyframes that have been created on that layer. Now, because we only have two keyframes that have been created for this layer, we can only select keyframe one or two in our specific apply to range, which you find here on the right. When you have additional keyframes that are in place and created, you'll be able to choose any pair that you wish to add a modifier to by changing your apply to setting to specific keyframe and then choosing that range of keyframes to the right. Beneath our target settings, we have the actions list. The actions list is where the individual actions that make up your modifier appear. Right now, we only have one action, and it's a new action that we have yet to configure. Now, it's important to consider that modifiers act essentially as containers. That is, a modifier is the sum total of its actions. A modifier that has no actions essentially has a value of zero. That means that it doesn't do anything at all. So with the modifier currently configured with a new action that isn't doing anything, this modifier is basically non-functional. 
We'll get into the action settings themselves and how these directly affect your modifiers in just a moment. Now beneath the list of actions that shows you all of the currently active actions associated with your modifier, you have the selected action settings. This is where you configure and determine exactly how your action is going to behave. The first thing that you have to configure when making a new action is the type of action that you're creating. Your first action can either add to or subtract from the modifier. Now once you've chosen the operation that you want your action to perform, you have to choose how you want your action to get its value. You have three options that are visible by radio button here beneath the selected action settings. The first option that we have is constant amount. This adds or subtracts a flat value from your particular setting. So as a quick demonstration, if I were to change my action to subtract from modifier and use a constant amount of 5, this modifier is now removing 5 from my pan x value for layer 1. Now this is a very simple operation and constant values you'll find later in the workshop are primarily used to augment other actions. But it serves as an excellent starting point to demonstrate exactly how your modifiers function. Now we have two other kinds of action settings that we can choose. Our second is a variable amount. As the tooltip indicates, this is a variable amount that's applied based on some value from another layer or another caption. So what this means is that we can choose to determine what we want our action to change the value to based on value changes from any other setting on any other layer that's attached to the slide. Now currently we only have one layer to choose from because we've only added one layer to this slide. However, as we begin working with examples that contain multiple layers, you'll find that you have quite a few more options for configuring your variable actions. Our final option is a mount from function. This causes the action to change or adjust the value based on a select series of functions that you can use. Now these are traditional mathematical functions, things that you very commonly see when you're doing advanced mathematics. We have the common sine wave and its companion cosine wave. We have a block wave. We have a sawtooth wave. We have a triangle wave. We have a random wave, which is randomly generated each time you create the modifier. We have a linear ramp. And we have a quadratic curve. Now, each one of these will change the way the value is adjusted by the modifier. This is based on whatever operation or change this particular function may perform. As a brief explanation, let's start with something simple like a sine wave. A sine wave is a gradually increasing and decreasing value change. You can see this in the waveform preview on the right, and I'll explain more about how this works in just a moment. For now, however, just remember that a sine wave, as you can see there, increases and decreases the value an even amount flowing up and down. What this means is that your modifier will use an add action and it will add value or remove value based on the changes of the sine wave. And this has a direct impact on how your layer behaves. And again, that's something that we'll look at in more detail here in just a moment. Now beyond your action settings, if we move to the right, we have the waveform preview. Just above the waveform preview, you can see a keyframe timeline. The waveform preview and the keyframe timeline are tied directly together. This means that any point in time where you want to observe what's happening on your slide conforms directly to what you're seeing in the waveform preview. Now these two are designed to allow you to read exactly what is going to happen when you're configuring actions within your modifier. So taking the example that we have now, let's look first at the keyframe timeline. Here we can see that we have two keyframes indicated by the keyframe markers at the top of the timeline. We can see our total time value along the top and both our slide and transition time along the bottom. Now take a look at the waveform preview. 
Just beneath it, we can see our undulating sine wave, which is indicating an increase followed by a decrease in value until we reach the end of the slide. This is how we can begin to read exactly how the behavior of a particular layer is going to be altered. So for example, if we look at our action, we have one current action configured as a sine wave that's going to add to the modifier. It has a certain set frequency and amplitude that can be adjusted at any time. But sticking to the defaults, let's begin to read the waveform preview to understand exactly how this modification is going to work. Here we can see that the value starts at zero. If you look along the left edge of your waveform preview, this is an indication of the actual value range that can be changed. So we can see that it's showing us negative 100 to positive 100. This translates directly to the actual value of your setting. Now if you recall, your pan value has a full range of 100 from the left to the right edge of the slide and also from the top to the bottom. Negative 50 is the far left edge of the slide and positive 50 is the far right edge of the slide. Your layer's position is based on the exact center point of the layer. So what this means, if you begin to look at the waveform preview, is that it's going to start at the beginning of the slide, indicated by the keyframe timeline, at zero. It's then going to increase to positive 50 at about the half second mark. From there, it's going to decrease to negative 50 at about the one and a half second mark. So this allows you to begin to read and predict exactly what's going to happen with your layer. In addition to being able to read the waveform preview, you can also scrub through to get a preview of what's going to happen to your slide at any time. So I can left click and hold the mouse button underneath the keyframe timeline, and this then allows me to scrub through to see what this modifier is going to do. And this is where we can directly begin to see exactly how this change is applied. We begin at a value of zero, which is the layer centered in the middle of the slide. It then increases along the sine wave to positive 50, as indicated in the waveform preview. Notice that this has shifted the center point of the layer to the far right edge of your slide frame. The value then decreases following the sine wave to negative 50. Notice that this has moved the center point of our layer to the far left side of the slide frame. The sine wave then continues in this undulating fashion all the way until we reach the end of the slide with the close of the transition time. So the waveform preview directly indicates to you exactly what's going to happen with the change that you've configured. And you can control what's shown to you on the waveform preview. So right now, we're looking at the total modifier. That is, the complete change to the value based on all of the actions within the modifier. We can also look at the original value for the layer, which is shown in blue. If you recall, I left the pan x value set to zero. So it shows me that the original value of this layer is zero. And since that value is unchanging, it's simply a flat line all the way from start to end. Then we have the modified value, which is showing you what this particular modifier is doing to this layer. As you can see, this is indicated in orange, and since we're only using an individual modifier, that orange line perfectly follows the sine wave that we can see in the total modifier. So you can use the legend underneath the waveform preview to view exactly which portion of your waveform preview you want to see to get a complete idea of how that change is applied. Also remember that at any time you can play a preview of what you've configured to see exactly how that modifier is going to impact the look of your slide. As a final note before we move on to the next chapter, it's important to recognize how a modifier is indicated in your interface. A value that has a modifier applied to it has a small red tick mark on the upper right hand corner of the value field. This indicates that a modifier is active. You can see that this is the case for the pan x value in both the starting and in the ending position. If at any time you wish to edit a modifier that you've created, right click on a modified value and select edit modifier. 
This will take you back into the modifier interface to make any changes you deem appropriate. If at any time you wish to remove a modifier from a slide, simply right click on the value and select Remove Modifier. That will then completely take it away and any effect that it had on the slide will no longer be present. Now let's move on to Chapter 3 where we can begin creating some simple modifiers together to give you a sense of exactly how to implement and work with the modifier settings. And now we move on to Chapter 3 where we begin creating some simple examples that make use of modifiers to make effects easier and introduce exactly how you can configure and create your own modifiers. Now please feel free to work with me in this particular chapter. We'll be moving slowly through the settings and I'll make sure that you're able to follow along. The material that we're going to use for this chapter can be found in your Media Sources folder under the ProShow Workshop Working with Modifiers folder. Let's begin by creating a new slide and let's create this new slide to start with simply one image. So I'm going to use Landscape Beach 03 this image here and drag and drop into the slide list to get us started. Now without changing the slide time I'm going to go in and configure some simple keyframe motion for this mo topmost layer. Let's double click on the slide to open the slide options and let's make our way to the motion effects tab. Here in the motion effects I'm going to add two additional keyframes to the slide and one of the easiest ways to do this is simply to right click in the keyframe timeline, select insert multiple, and type in two. This gives me two new keyframes as part of my layer. Now with these keyframes configured, I'm going to move keyframe two back to one second and keyframe three back to two seconds. With this configured, I'm now going to create some very simple motion. So in the starting position, I'm going to reduce my layer size down to 40%, and let's begin with the layer in the upper left-hand corner. Then in the keyframe 2 position, I'm going to reduce the layer to 40% as well, and I'll place it in the upper right-hand corner. Now let's move on to keyframes 2 and 3. In the keyframe 3 position, again, I'll reduce the size of the layer to about 40%, and then I'll place the layer in the lower left hand corner and finally select keyframes 3 and 4 and again reduce the size of the layer to 40 percent and then place the layer in the lower right hand corner. This will give us a motion path basically like a backward S. If we play this back we can see our straightforward keyframe motion just like so. Now what we're going to do is use a modifier to cause a second image layer to pursue our first image layer around the slide without the need for any keyframe configuration. And that's going to use a variable action setting, the same kind that we took a brief look at in Chapter 2. Let's select our next image. In this case, we'll use Landscape Desert 02, and we're going to add this as a new layer to the slide we just configured. To do this, hold down control, drag, and drop that layer right on top of the slide. Now double click to open the slide options and let's begin by moving layer number one to the bottom of the slide list by simply clicking the down arrow icon. This now makes it the lower layer in our pair. With this done, we're going to configure the appearance of this particular layer. All I'm going to do for this is change my zoom value to the same thing, 40%, and then I'll simply click on Copy and choose Copy Start to End to make sure that this layer remains at 40% zoom all the way through. Here's where the modifier comes into play. We're going to use a modifier to cause layer number two to perfectly follow layer number one around the slide frame. Notice right now with simply two keyframes in place, layer number one moves about as we configured and layer number two simply sits in one place. Let's change that with the use of a modifier. We'll begin with the familiar pan x or horizontal position value for layer number two. 
Make sure you've selected layer number two from your layers list and then right click on the pan X value and select add modifier. Now remember that you want to configure layer number two to perfectly pursue layer number one around the slide. So to begin we have pan X chosen for layer number two so we can verify in our modifier target that we're working with the correct value. We also want to apply this change to all keyframes since we only have two and now we can begin configuring the action. Let's set our type of action to add to modifier. With this done, remember that we want layer number two to automatically follow layer number one around the slide. A constant amount wouldn't get the job done. That would simply add some particular amount to my pan X value without actually making a change. Amount from function would give me some kind of function based change in value which wouldn't perfectly follow around layer number one. So what we need to use here is a variable amount that we can then base on layer number one. So we want to choose the pan X value but we need to change our layer selection. Now as a brief point notice that right now I have a red warning that's appeared in the lower right hand corner of my interface. It's currently saying that this modifier has cyclic dependencies and that the results of this modifier might be unpredictable. It's telling me this because if you notice I'm setting my variable amount to be based on the pan X value of layer number two. Well my current target value is the pan X for layer number two. So essentially what I'm telling the program is that this particular value is equal to the same value. That inherently means that the value is undefined and it can't perform an action based on an undefined value. So this is simply a warning that it's not going to work. To change this all we have to do is select our target layer and change that to layer number one. Now we're getting a variable amount that's based on the pan X position from layer number one rather than layer number two. So essentially right now we're saying that pan X for layer number two is going to get its value from pan X on layer number one. And with that selection made we can see our waveform preview update to indicate the change that will be made. Here we can see that the layer will start on the left hand corner of the slide. It will then move to the right, move back to the left and then slowly move to the right again. Watch what happens if I play this preview. Notice that we start on the left, move to the right, back to the left, and then gradually over to the right. That preview tells you exactly what the waveform preview is telling you, and that is, start on the left, we perfectly follow layer number one as it moves around the slide until we reach the end of the slide. All that done by getting the value for layer two's pan X position from layer one's pan X position. Now remember, we want these layers to perfectly follow one another around. To do this, I also need to do the same thing for the pan Y, which is the vertical position. So I can click on OK to save the configuration on this modifier, and then I'm going to right click on my pan Y value, and again select Add Modifier. We're going to use the exact same modifier type. Make sure we have pan Y for layer 2 as our target, applied to all keyframes. We want our action to be an add to modifier action. We want this action to be a variable amount based on the pan Y value from layer number one. Once we've made that selection we can see the waveform preview update to tell us where it's going to move. And if we play the preview back then we can no longer see layer number two. And the reason for that is because layer number two is perfectly following layer number one as it moves around the slide. If we did want to get a slight glimpse at layer number two, we can always use a multiplier to slightly change the values it uses. Right now, it's taking an exact one for one measurement of the value it's getting from layer number one. But what if I were to change this to get one and a half times the value? by adjusting my multiplier to 1.5. Now, if you watch, the vertical position of the layer is slightly accented because I'm taking the value from layer number one and multiplying it by 1.5. I can apply this same kind of change 
to the value for my pan X modifier. Right click on pan X, choose edit modifier, and let's change the multiplier for this one to 1.5 as well. With this done, if I play the final effect back, you'll see that now it perfectly chases the layer around, however its motion is slightly more accented by the fact that I've added a slight multiplier. Now what makes this particular example truly flexible is that I have the ability to make a change at any time yet still have the effect work. So for example, I can adjust keyframe number three and four to be a completely different motion path and then I can play the effect back and notice that layer number two still accurately follows layer number one as it moves about the slide. And remember, that's because we've set no values for layer number two. We've simply told it using modifiers that we want it to perfectly chase layer number one as it moves around the slide. So this is an example we refer to as layer tag and it's an excellent demonstration of the kind of flexibility and time savings that you can get with the use of modifiers. Rather than configuring individual keyframes to make those two layers coordinate together, I simply set one and then use a modifier to do the rest. Let's create a second example. This particular example I like to call the dog shake. In this example, we're going to create a layer that shakes as well as ties itself to another value so that we can create an interesting blurring effect. To do this, let's create a new slide with the image Rustic05. Drag and drop this one into the slide list, and without adjusting the slide time, let's double click on the slide to open the slide options. Now to begin, I'm going to go to my Layers and Layer Settings tab, and I'm simply going to reduce the zoom value of this layer to 50% so that it doesn't take up the entire slide frame. With this done, I'm now ready to configure the effect. Let's go back to the Effects and Motion Effects tab. So here's what we're going to do with this particular example. What I want this image to do is shake from the top, just like a dog would if it were drying itself off. And we're going to create this erratic shaking by using a modifier. To begin, I'm going to adjust keyframe number one so that it starts at the beginning of my slide time at three seconds in. I'm then going to add a new keyframe at four seconds by double left clicking on the timeline. I'll add another new keyframe by double clicking at five seconds on my timeline. And I'll leave number four at the end of the slide. Now I've added two additional keyframes because I don't want my image layer to shake the entire time. I simply want it to shake during the period of time from keyframes two to three. Now to get started, because I want this layer to shake at the top rather than from the middle, I need to adjust my rotation center so that it's at the bottom of the layer. To do this, I can change my rotation center Y value to 50. And if you notice, this then moves the center point of the layer down to the very bottom. With this set, I'm then going to right click on my new value and I'm going to select copy rotation center Y to all keyframes on this slide. That will then adjust my rotation center to the bottom of the image layer for every keyframe here. Now with this done, I'm ready to begin creating my modifier that will make this shake. To do this, I'm going to choose keyframes two and three, and because I'm making an effect that is a shake, I need to use rotation. So I'm going to right click on my rotate value and choose add modifier. With this done, first make sure that your modifier target is correct. Here we can see it's set to rotate for layer number one. And then we're going to apply to a specific keyframe range rather than all keyframes. We only want this shake to take place during keyframes two and three. Notice that with this chosen, the rest of the unselected keyframes in my waveform preview are grayed out and only keyframes two and three are selected. This tells me that I've got the proper configuration for my target keyframe range. Now we need to configure an action that's going to create the erratic shaking that you see when a dog dries off. Now a variable amount would require that we use some other layer and remember that a constant amount is unchanging. 
So to create an erratic, random look to my shaking, I need to use an amount from function. And the key word that I used to help me select an appropriate function was random. With that said, I can choose a random function to generate my unpredictable motion. Now here we can see that the waveform has updated to reflect what this random is going to do. And if I preview this just as it is, we can see that when the layer appears and it goes through its shaking process, it very abruptly bows to the right as part of that shake. Now that looks nothing like a dog shaking, so we're going to need to make some adjustments to this random function to make it more accurate. To do this, I first need to begin by adjusting the range. The range of this effect is how much that value can change. Now right now, it goes all the way from 0 to 50. Now I want to reduce the potential range down to something much less severe. Let's try a range of 10. Notice that when I change the range to 10, it tends to soften up that random waveform. If I play this back with that change made, we can see that the shake will now be far less severe. But we still don't have enough shakes to make it look convincing. To get additional spikes in my random waveform, I need to adjust the granularity, that is the individual time between samples. I'm going to reduce the granularity to 1. Notice that now I have a far more erratic pattern to my waveform, and this should tell me that I'm getting close to something that will be accurate. If I play this back, we can see now that the layer begins to shake much more erratically and unpredictably. However, we still have a problem that we need to address as part of the modifier, and that is, if you notice, the shaking of the layer only adjusts to the right. I have no left motion as part of its rotation. Now we can see that this is the case by looking at the waveform preview. If I zoom in a bit for you, it will become a bit more obvious. Notice that here we can see the waveform only goes as low as 0 and only goes as high as the range I specified, 10. Now remember that positive rotation is a positive value in degrees that goes right and negative rotation goes to the left. So to make it go both left and right, I need to have both positive and negative changes in my random waveform. How can I adjust this random waveform so that it does both positive and negative? This is where constant variables become incredibly valuable. What we're going to do is add a new action to this modifier. And remember that a modifier is simply the cumulative effect of your actions. So with this new action, I'm going to change its type to subtract from modifier. But as a side note, Notice that I now have some additional options, that is multiply and divide, rather than simply add and subtract. These are available for any secondary or later action that you create. Look at it this way. If you have a new action, the first one that you're configuring, the essential value of the modifier at this point is zero. You can't multiply or divide by zero, which means that those options aren't available for your first action. However, once you have one action added to create an actual value for your modifier, then you can use multiply or divide. Now for our effect, we're going to use subtract from modifier. And we're going to change the value to a constant amount of 5. Now why does this work the way it does? Notice that when I added that secondary action, now my waveform goes both above and below the 0 degrees point. This is because these actions work together. I have a random waveform set with a range of 10 with a starting baseline of 0. I then added a constant action which subtracts 5 from the modifier, which then changes my range from 0 to 10 to negative 5 to positive 5. These two actions work directly together. Now if I scrub through, you can see that my layer moves both left and right to give me that convincing back and forth shaking effect. And it only does it for the keyframe range 2 to 3. With this done, click on OK 
and now I can play the effect back we'll see that the image appears at the start of the slide time it then shakes comes to a stop and remains in position until the end of the slide now let's augment this just a little bit we're going to go to the adjustment effects tab and we're going to add some blur so that the image layer appears to blur as it shakes so locate your blur value right click and choose add modifier now again we want to apply this only to specific keyframes and in this case keyframes two and three now how can we make our image layer blur only when it shakes this is the perfect opportunity to use a variable amount we're going to use a variable amount based on the rotate from layer number one this means that it's going to change the blur based on the rotation changes that happen in layer number one so if I play this back what it's going to do now is when this layer rotates it'll add blur now the effect is not very pronounced just as it is because there's not much of a value change taking place in the rotation remember it's going from negative five to positive five but if I multiply this by 10 now that value change is going to be severely augmented which means that we're going to see a much more obvious blur take place as it shakes so there you can see how you can add modifiers to specific values for only a set range of keyframes and how you can tie multiple modifiers together to begin creating these interesting effects and remember that if you consider the number of shakes that take place just on that one image layer it would potentially take over 50 keyframes to make that shake look accurate if you were to try and do that without the use of modifiers and now in chapter four we're going to take the examples that we created in chapter three both layer tag and the dog wag and we're going to refine these a bit and make them into something that's far more acceptable for public consumption the idea here is that the concepts you learned in chapter three can be directly translated into execution for very practical very usable effects that can be made quite a bit easier than if you were working with keyframes let's start with the first example this one I like to refer to as the layered pan and what we're going to do is create a continuous panning sequence from start to end which will bring multiple layers across the slide frame so that your audience can see and appreciate them to create this particular example we're going to use the four images that I've selected here this is image one four by three through image four once you have these four images chosen please hold down control and drag and drop them right into your slide frame to create a new slide and then let's change the time of this slide to six seconds and let's change the transition time to zero seconds with that done we're now ready to begin creating our effect let's double click on the slide to open the slide options and we're going to start with the initial position of layer number one now I want to leave this layer right as it is as far as its size and its placement on the slide frame I'm also going to leave it with only two keyframes however in the ending position I'm going to change its pan value to negative 270 this is going to move the layer far outside the left edge of the slide frame and the reason I'm doing this is because I want to tie my other three image layers to the pan of layer number one with modifiers and I'll be working in 90 point increments so 270 gives me four 90 point increments to work with and I have four images that I'm going to display with that in mind let's go to the layers and layer settings tab and let's begin setting the starting position for all three of my additional image layers I want to start layer number two at a position value of 90 this will move it off the right side of the slide frame and just outside of view then I'm going to select image layer number three and I'm going to change the position of this one to 180 that moves it the same distance beyond layer number two so in essence I'm creating a lineup of images that are appearing outside of the slide frame finally for layer number four let's change its position value to 270 
Now, if you begin to think about how this motion is going to take place, if we go back to the Effects and Motion Effects tab, remember that image layer number one starts in the middle of the slide frame and then pans out all the way to negative 270. That's horizontal motion to the left with modifiers tying the position of image layers 2 through 4 to the movement of number 1, I'm essentially going to create a continuous pan through all four images. So let's begin creating the modifiers that will actually make this effect work. Select layer 2 in your layers list and then let's right click on the pan X value and select add modifier. For this modifier creation we're going to tie this directly to the position of layer number 1. And remember, a constant amount is simply going to add a set value to my particular layer, and an amount from function is going to give me a result based on a function waveform, neither one of which will tie it directly to layer 1. So what I want to use is a variable amount. So again, verify that your modifier target is correct. This is pan X on layer number 2. We want to apply this to all keyframes. So let's now create a new action, which is a variable amount, we want this to be based on the pan X position of layer number one. With that selection made, notice that your waveform preview has updated to show you that this image will be moving in a negative value direction, which will take it off to the left. With that done, click on OK. Let's now play back a preview of this to see what our first modifier is going to do. We can see our initial image layer move to the left, and it simply takes layer number two right along with it as it pans out of view. We're essentially creating a continuous strip of panning images. Now let's move on to layer number three and again right click on the pan X value and select add modifier. Here we want to create the exact same kind of modifier that we made just a moment ago. So once again make sure that your target is correct pan X for layer number three. We want this applied to all keyframes and again we want to use a variable amount based on the pan X of layer number one. Once you've made that selection, again verify that your waveform preview looks correct and then click on OK. Again if we play this back, now we'll see layer number one moves, it brings layer number two with it, and layer number three comes along as well. Let's conclude by adding layer number four into the mix. Select layer number four from your layers list and again right click on the pan X value. Select add modifier. Here again we're going to create the exact same kind of modifier, so we want a variable amount based on pan X from layer number one. Once again verify that your waveform is correct and then click on OK. With this done we now have a complete effect. As we can see here layer number one pans to the left and it automatically brings my other three image layers along with us giving us this interesting panning sequence. Now this effect can be further refined what we've created here is a continuous pan of images. If you wanted to refine this to make it just a bit easier to spend some time looking at all four of those images, we can add some motion pauses by adjusting the keyframes for only layer number one. Because layers two through four are automatically following layer one through the use of modifiers, we can dictate the motion of our entire strip simply by changing the way layer one moves. So here's what we're going to do. Right click in your keyframe timeline and select insert multiple. This will allow us to insert multiple keyframes. Type in six and click on OK. This will give us six new evenly spaced keyframes throughout our slide. Now what we're going to do here is use each alternating keyframe to pan layer number one and then hold it in position for a moment and then continue panning again. So for keyframes 1 and 2, begin by clicking on the copy icon and selecting copy start to end. This will make sure that layer number 1 remains in place at the beginning of the slide. Then select keyframes 2 and 3, and in the keyframe 3 position, change the pan X value to negative 90. That's going to move it, our first image sequence, out of view and bring in layer number 2. Now let's select keyframes 3 and 4, and once again, click on the copy icon and choose copy start to end. This will make sure that this keyframe pair is identical so that it holds layer number 2 in view. Now select keyframes 4 and 5, and in the keyframe 5 position, change the pan X value to negative 180. 
That will bring in image layer number three. And with that done, click on keyframes five and six. Once again, click on copy and choose copy start to end to make sure that this pair stays identical. Then move on to keyframes six and seven and change the pan value for keyframe seven to negative 270. With that done, it will bring in our fourth and final image layer. Then click on keyframes seven and eight and simply verify that your pan values are both equal to negative 270. Now with this alternating motion, this is going to cause layer number one to remain still for a moment, then move out of view bringing in layer number two, remain still, then move on to layer number three, remain still, move in image layer number four, and then finally hold that still for a moment before the end of the slide. Let's play this back and see if we have the results that we expect. So image layer number one holds still and moves, two, three, and finally four. So there we can see that not only are we able to tie the visual effects of modifiers straight into one image layer, but we can also improve the example beyond being a continuous pan into a staged multi keyframe pan without having to make changes to anything other than one layer. So that's a very good demonstration of exactly how much time and effort modifiers can save you. It would have taken a significant amount of additional time to create that example using keyframes for every single image layer. Now let's move on to our second example of this chapter. And this, the color shake, is something that refines on the concept of the dog wag to make a particular concept that's a little bit more workable and visually pleasing as part of your show. Let's begin by adding these four image layers into the slide. That's Texture Weave, Space 02, Rustic 01, and Rustic 05. Once you have all four selected, hold down Control and drop them into your slide list to create a new slide. Let's change the times for this to three seconds of slide time and two seconds of transition time. With that done, let's now open the slide options and begin configuring the visual layout of this slide before we create our modifiers. So double click on the slide to open the slide options and let's go to the layers and layer settings tab. Here, let's begin by taking our weave texture image and making sure that it appears at the very bottom of your image and layer list. With the weave texture at the bottom, change its scaling value to fill frame. Now, this particular image is simply going to act as some visual texture as a backdrop. Now select layer number one and change the zoom value of this layer to 70%, just to bring the size of it down a bit. From here, right click on your 70% and select copy zoom to all layers on this slide. This will make sure that all of our images have the same zoom value. Now to make sure that layer number four continues to fill the entire slide frame, simply select layer number four and click on the reset arrow icon on the zoom value. Now we have all of our images at the same size. Let's go ahead and position these within the slide frame. I'm going to start by leaving layer number one right in the middle and just adding a small bit of rotation to the left. I'm then going to take layer number two and move it over to the left a bit and I'm also going to add just a slight bit of rotation to it, just to the right a hair. Finally I'll select layer number three, move it over to the right edge of the slide frame and again just add a little bit of additional rotation, a little bit more than I have on my other image layers. With that done, I now have the basic visual placement arranged. Once you have something that looks similar, go ahead and move on to the editing tab. Here in the editing tab, we're simply going to add an outline and a drop shadow to all of the image layers that appear on this slide. And that's just to make it a bit more visually distinct from the background. So enable an outline for layer number three, then right click on the outline and select copy enable to all layers on this slide. Then enable a drop shadow and once again right click on the drop shadow button and choose copy enable to all layers on this slide. With that done we now have the visual arrangement that will make these layers look nice. Let's get started by setting up the effects that will actually carry this sequence. To do this let's move on to the effects and adjustment effects tab. Now what we're going to do is we want these images to begin the slide in black and white. Then we want them to shake and add color back into them as they shake. 
and then hold that position until the end of the slide. We're going to need two additional keyframes to do this for the shaking and color sequence. So let's add a new keyframe at one second and a new keyframe at two seconds. With these additional keyframes added, select keyframes one and two and enable colorize. Leave colorize at its default gray value. Then select keyframes two and three, enable colorize in keyframe two, and then to make sure that it's completely disabled in keyframe three, simply toggle colorize on and then off again to turn it off completely. Verify in keyframes three and four that colorize is disabled. With that done, we can now do the same thing for layer number two. Select layer number two, and again, add a new keyframe at one second and a new keyframe at two seconds. With that done, select keyframe one, enable colorize, enable colorize in keyframe two, then select keyframes two and three, and remember to toggle colorize on and off in keyframe number three. Moving on to our final image layer, number one, Again, add a new keyframe at one second and at two seconds. Then enable colorize for keyframe number one and keyframe number two. Select keyframe pairs two and three, and remember to toggle colorize on and off for keyframe number three. With that done, we're now ready to add the modifiers that will create our shaking look. To do this, let's go to the motion effects tab, and let's begin with image layer number one. Select layer number one from your layers list, choose keyframes two and three, and let's then add a modifier to the rotation value. Right click on the rotate value and select add modifier. Now we want to create a rather predictable and regular rotation. We don't want to make something as erratic as we saw in the dog wag. So to begin, first select apply to specific keyframe and make sure that your keyframe range is configured to two and three. With this done, we're going to create a modifier that's based on an amount from function. And again, instead of selecting a random function, let's use a sine wave and simply control its attributes just a little bit so that it's not as erratic a shake. So let's begin configuring the sine wave to be set to the start of the keyframe. Let's then adjust the frequency value to six to give us far more waves but let's reduce the actual amplitude of it to two. That gives us a nice, much more regular wave pattern that we can see right there in the waveform preview. If I play this back, we'll see that layer number one has a nice back and forth motion that shakes as the color comes back into it. That's something that's not nearly as jarring as we saw in our dog wag example, and it gets the job done nicely. We'll also be able to coordinate this sine wave effect with the other two image layers. So let's click on OK to preserve this modifier. And now let's move on to image layer number two. Select layer number two. Again, right click on the rotate value and select add modifier. Remember to begin by changing your apply to target to specific keyframe and select keyframe pairs two and three. Then we're going to change our modifier type to an amount from function. We're going to use a sine wave based on the start of the keyframe Remember that we're using a frequency of six and an amplitude of two. With that done, let's now play back the preview to see how this modifier impacts it. Now we can see two image layers shaking together to bring in their color. We have one last layer to go. Click on OK to apply that modifier. Let's move on to layer number three. And here again, we're going to right click on the rotate value and choose add modifier. Don't forget to change your keyframe target to specific keyframes, in this case keyframes two and three. Then again, we're going to use an amount from function in the form of a sine wave. Remember to change your wave begins to start of keyframe, adjust your frequency to six, and your amplitude to two. There we have that same gentle sine wave pattern and again, if we preview this, now all three image layers will shake together, restoring their color. Let's click on OK and take a look at our final two effects that we put together. So our first effect, once again, is a multi-staged pan using variable modifiers to tie the position of multiple layers together. Our second example 
uses modifiers along with some effects keyframing to create an interesting color shake effect that allows you a more practical and visually impressive version of the dog wag that you can apply to just about any show. Now that we've reached chapter number five, we're going to discuss how modifiers can also be applied to captions. Now, if you recall, in the early chapters of the workshop, I introduced that you could use modifiers in three sections. You could use modifiers with motion effects, adjustment effects, and finally, caption motion. We're going to take a look at caption motion now. The example that we're going to create to illustrate captions used with modifiers is a demonstration title slide. This is something that you can use as a studio logo or just a quick beginning to your show. We're going to begin by creating a new slide by dragging and dropping our single image for this chapter into the slide list. With that done, let's leave the slide time at 3 seconds and the transition time at 3 seconds as well. Now to get us started, we first need to do some visual arrangement of the appearance of our backdrop. So let's begin with that before we add in the captions. Double click on the slide to open the options and let's go to the layers and layer settings tab. Here, let's begin by adjusting the scaling of layer number one to fill frame. And then let's simply refine this a bit by adjusting the position of the layer so that our central block appears right in the middle of the slide frame, just like so. With that done, we're now ready to make some changes to the overall look of the layer to serve as, in back, as a backdrop accent to the caption. To do this, we're going to go to the Editing tab, and here, we're going to just change the color balance of it a little bit. I'm going to start by reducing the brightness down to about 75% to allow a little bit of my black backdrop to show through. I'm also going to adjust the white point to bring out the accents in the steel just a bit up to about 25 percent. I'm going to bring the black point down to further accent those color differences again down to about 25 percent and that's going to bring the texture of my backdrop into view a little bit better. Finally we can increase the contrast a bit just to give it a more blown out appearance and we'll do that at about 20 percent. That's now accented and drawn out the interesting visual texture of our background. With this done, we're now ready to configure the caption that will make this whole effect work. Now what we're going to create here is just a simple studio logo. To begin, we're going to go to the Caption and Caption Settings tab, where we actually have to start by creating the caption that's going to make this effect work. What we're going to create is a title for Heavy Productions and then our effect is going to rely on creating a sense of weight and heft to the name of the studio. So let's begin by creating the studio name first, create a new caption that says HEAVY, all in capital letters. With this done, let's start configuring the appearance of this caption. I want to change the font type to IMPACT. This is a caption that should be on just about every Windows installation out there. You should have it as well. And with impact as the font type chosen, let's reduce the size to 96. With the size reduced, we can leave the color at white. And now, let's add the second caption that's going to make this effect work. So click on Add New Caption, and type in simply Productions. Now we're going to change the font size and font type for productions. I'm going to change this one back to Arial since it makes an excellent sans serif standby and I'm going to reduce the font size to about 30. And I'll take this and I'm going to adjust the position of both of these before I go in and begin adding their motion or their effects. Now let's start by selecting Heavy and for this particular caption I'm going to add a drop shadow to it to give it a greater sense of heft and I'm also going to then select Productions and give Productions a black outline just to make it stand out against the steel. Now I have some contrasting differences between my captions. With Heavy selected, I'm going to adjust its position so that it appears at 50 by 65. That's going to place it a bit lower on the slide frame. I'm then also going to select Productions and I want it to appear 
at 50 by 65 as well. Now what we're going to do here is arrange the appearance of these captions so that heavy will drop in from the top of the slide frame, appear to slam down when it comes to rest, and cause the entire slide to shake with the impact. When it does this, it's going to destroy the productions portion of the caption logo in the process. And that will be our way of conveying that visual sense of weight to the overall effect. So with our captions now created and positioned, we're ready to go in and configure the motion and the modifier that's going to make this effect work. Let's move on to the Caption Motion tab. Now I want to begin by simply configuring Heavy. Since this is going to be the primary visual element of our introduction slide, we want this to have all of its configuration set up and ready to go. Now I don't want Heavy to appear right at the beginning of the slide. I want it to abruptly drop into place about one second after the slide is started. So I'm going to adjust keyframe one all the way up to one second. If you want to be precise, remember that you can right click on the keyframe and then choose set time. With this done, I now need to make it look as if Heavy is going to drop in from the top of the slide very, very quickly and come to rest. To do this, I don't think that my drop needs to take more than about a half a second. So I'm going to add a new keyframe, and if keyframe number one is set to one second, I'm going to adjust keyframe number two to 1.25 seconds. That's going to give me a quarter of a second for that to drop into place, and that should give me an excellent sense of weight. Now with that keyframe in place, I also want Heavy to shake when it comes and hits the ground in this particular example, so that it looks like it has real weight behind it. To do this, I'm going to add another keyframe for the impact rumble, and I want this to be set just about a quarter of a second after keyframe number two. So I'll right click on keyframe number three and set it to 1.5 seconds. With that done, I now have the basic keyframes configured that I need for the effect. Let's start configuring that motion. For keyframe number one to two, I'm going to start by simply pulling heavy all the way off the top of the slide. Now, this means that I want my starting position to be about 50 by negative 45 or so. In the keyframe number two position, I want it to come to rest where I had it set originally at 50 by 65. Now, from keyframes two to three, I want it to rumble with that impact. We're going to use a modifier to configure that, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And then finally, from keyframes three to four, I want it to simply stay in place. So now if I play this back, Heavy will drop into place very quickly. One thing that you may want to do is adjust keyframe four back to the end of your slide time and perhaps give your effect, your caption, a fly out effect. Let's give this one something simple, like a fade out, just at the end of the slide. So now Heavy will drop into place and then it will remain there until we reach the end of the slide where it'll fade out of view. Let's configure productions before we close out the effect by adding the modifiers that will make the entire visual weight get carried. Select productions and here we're going to configure productions so that it appears at the beginning of the slide and why don't we add a fly in effect to this. I'm going to click on the fly in effect and give it a simple fade in just like so. I'm going to adjust my fade in time to be about one half second long. And now what we want is for productions to appear to get destroyed by the heavy logo as it drops in on top of it. Heavy will impact that productions logo at about the one and a quarter second time period. So I'm going to right click on keyframe number two, choose set time and adjust it to 1.25 seconds. So what I should see is productions fade in, heavy drop into place, and productions disappear. To make productions look as if it's actually knocked out by the appearing heavy, I'm going to add a fly out effect to this and change the fly out effect to explode. With that done, I then want to adjust my fly out effect to start right about the time heavy hits it, which would be about a quarter of a second long. 
and remember to adjust your fly-in time to accommodate for that change. So now what I should see is heavy drops into place and knocks production out of the way. If you want to enhance or further allow productions to linger, you can always adjust its keyframe time back, but make sure that the explosion takes place right when heavy impacts it. So I can, for example, adjust keyframe 2 back to 1 and 3 quarter seconds, and then adjust my actual transition to take place right when heavy impacts it, just like so. So now Productions is knocked out of the way, Heavy is left remaining. To finalize this, I need to add in my modifiers. So we're going to create a modifier for Heavy taking place at keyframes 2 and 3. Now modifiers, when applied to captions, work exactly the same way as they do when applied to layers. So to make this look like a heavy impact, we're going to add a modifier to the X and Y position. Right-click on the X position for Heavy, and select Add Modifier. Notice that the modifier interface is exactly the same. There is literally no difference between them. We're going to select our target to specific keyframes, in this case keyframes 2 and 3, and here we want that same kind of erratic heavy impact shake that we created previously for the dog wag. To do this, once again, we'll use an amount from function, and let's select a random function as our type, and again, we want to reduce the range so that it's not quite as abrupt. Let's change the range to 5. And let's adjust the granularity to something very severe, like 0.5. It's going to give us an incredible amount of vibration. And if I play this back, you'll see that heavy impacts and shakes. Now, I want heavy to move both left and right. So once again, we have to adjust the range so that it falls in both the zero and the negative area. To do this, I'm going to add another action. I'm going to subtract from the modifier, and I'm going to make it a constant amount of 2.5. That's half of the range for my random function, and that will give me a good left and right vibration when heavy comes and impacts. With that done, click on OK, and let's add this same kind of modifier to the Y position. So I'll right-click on the Y value, again select Add Modifier, and here we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to add a new modifier that's an amount from function. Again, make sure you have your keyframe range selected. That will be an amount from function, this time a random. Change the range of this to 5. Change the granularity to 0.5 to give us lots of variation. And then remember to add a new action, which will be subtract from modifier with a constant value of 2.5. With those two added together, heavy will bounce both up and down, giving us a, um, an abrupt and jarring impact. We're almost finished with the example. We have a good heavy thud when it comes to rest, but I think it still needs just a little bit more to carry that effect. So to do this, we're going to make the background jar as well, just to show exactly how heavy our logo is. To do this, let's go to the Effects and Motion Effects tab. Here, we want our layer to shake with the impact at the exact same time that the impact takes place. So let's add two new keyframes, 2 and 3, and then we're going to place keyframes 2 and 3 at the exact same times as our heavy caption. So right-click on keyframe number 2, choose Set Time, and set it to 1.25 seconds. And then right-click on keyframe number 3, choose Set Time, and set it to 1.5 seconds. Now with that done, what we're going to do, rather than creating shake for our background image, is we're going to create some blur. So let's go to Adjustment Effects. And in the Adjustment Effects tab, make sure you have keyframes 2 and 3 selected right-click on Blur, and select Add Modifier. Here again, change our keyframe range to specific keyframes, 2 and 3. And again, what we're going to do is use an amount from function. We're going to set it to be random. We want this range to be decently high to make that impact blur pretty severe, so we'll leave that at 50. Let's change to the same granularity at 0.5, and let's play this back and see how it looks. 
Heavy drops into place and boom, our background shakes with that impact at the same time Heavy comes to rest. And there we can see how captions can be tied directly into the exact same modifier interface that you use for your layers to create some great advanced caption effects. Let's see that one more time. Heavy drops in, destroys productions, and shakes the entire background as we come to the end of our title slide. In the final chapter of our disk, we're going to learn how to use modifiers for something beyond simply augmenting or enhancing your slide effects. Modifiers are powerful enough that they can be used to create things that you might not even consider possible in a slideshow. In this chapter, we're going to look at using modifiers as visual enhancements. That is, creating something that looks almost like a video and less like a slideshow. What we're going to create is an old-style film projection complete with all of the things that you would think would go into an old 8mm film. So let's begin by creating a new slide. We're going to use this image that you see here, Rustic 03. Drag and drop this into your slide list to create a new slide. Let's change the slide time to 6 seconds and the transition time to 0 seconds. With that done, before we begin creating and setting up the modifiers that are going to make this effect work, we first need to get the visuals in place to start with a convincing look and then use the modifiers to really complete the illusion. So let's double click on the slide to open the slide options and I'm going to begin by changing layer 1's scaling to fill frame. That way it fills up my entire slide display area. Now the first thing that we need if we're going to con create a convincing projector effect is a gradient that looks like a light source shining onto a screen. To do this we're going to add a new layer and select Add Gradient. With the Add Gradient window created we're going to select Masks as our preset and change our type to Radial. This default option should work pretty well what we're going to do is reduce the opacity of this default option to 0%. Once that's done, click on OK. Now you have an interesting constraint that appears along the outside edges of your image, making it appear lighter in the middle. So this is going to get us started to begin creating this projected look. The other thing that we need to do is make some editing to the appearance of layer number 2 so that it looks like an older piece of film. To do this, let's go to the Editing tab. Here, we're going to begin by actually increasing the brightness a little bit to remove some of the distinction between colors. A value of about 25% should do the trick. We're also going to decrease the white point just a tad to take away some of the clarity and decrease the black point as well. With that done, you can also decrease the contrast to soften the differences between the colors. And finally, we're going to colorize this image by checking Colorize. And we're going to change the color to a nice dirty brown, something about like so. And with that done, reduce the strength of your colorization to 75%. Now that's going to dramatically make a difference as far as the appearance of this particular image. We've got something that looks far older with a projector overlay on the top of it. Now there are two things that we still need to really make this look convincingly like a projection. The first is we need scratches and dust particles that would appear on old film. We have an image that's ready for you to use to do this. It's included in the workshop. This image is film grain located right here. What we're going to do is hold down control and add this as a new layer to the slide that we've been working on. With this done, go ahead and double click on the slide to open the options and let's move the film grain underneath the gradient so that it becomes layer number two. With that done, go to the layer settings tab and let's start by increasing the zoom value of our film grain to 250% blow it up to a nice large size. 
Now you can see that that starts to look just like film even though we can't see the image yet. Between the combination of the dust and scratches that appear on the film, it's beginning to look pretty convincing. To finalize the effect, we need to cause film grain to become a mask associated with our image layer. So make sure you have layer number two chosen and then click on the toggle button to turn on your masking layer. Now we're going to use an intensity mask for this and if you remember your rule for intensity masking, again that rule is light reveals and dark conceals. That means that everywhere we have light portions of the image, you'll be able to see our picture behind it. And everywhere there's dark specks, such as the dust and scratches, we won't be able to see the image. If you click on the image itself, or if you look at the image in the full preview by clicking on OK, now you can see that things are really starting to come together to give us this distinctive film look. Now we're not quite there yet. What we need to do now is create a combination of things, all of which are going to use modifiers. First, we need to create a layer that's going to flicker. That is, to look like the changing light values as the film moves across the bulb. Second, we need to create a bit of vibration in the image that's going to make it look just like you'd expect to see an image bouncing slightly as part of a projection. And third, we're going to need to create some visual variation in the dust and scratches that appear on the film to give it that final touch to be convincing. All of those are going to use modifiers. So to begin, let's start by adding a new solid color layer that's going to be our flickering change in opacity. To do this, click on Add New Layer and select Add Solid Color. We're going to change our solid color layer to black and leave all the other settings the same. With that done, click on OK. Now we want to move this solid color layer so that it appears under the gradient but above our mask. And now with this done, we're going to set up this particular layer so that it appears to flicker. To do this, let's go to the Effects and Adjustment Effects tab. To get us started, we're going to reduce the opacity of this layer to 0%, and then I'm going to do the same thing in the ending position. With that done, I'm now going to add a modifier to my opacity value. So right-click on Opacity and choose Add Modifier. Now here, once again, I want there to be an erratic and unpredictable change in the opacity level of my flicker. So to do this, again, make sure your modifier target is set correctly, the opacity of layer 2. This will apply to all keyframes. And remember, if we want something that's erratic and unpredictable, a random function does an excellent job of that. Now what we need to do is adjust both the range and the granularity to get an effective and convincing flicker. Let's begin by reducing the range a little bit. Let's drop the range down to 25 and let's adjust the granularity to 5 and see if this gives us something convincing. If you play this back, now you can see the flicker taking place. That looks pretty good, but it might be a bit too severe. So let's reduce the range to 15. With that adjusted, we can play back the preview again. Now we can see that we have a flicker, but it's not really obscuring the image. So that should do very, very well for our flicker effect. Click on OK to save that modifier. And now we're ready to add in some random horizontal or vertical motion to our image layer. So select layer number 4, and then in the Motion Effects tab, right-click on the Pan Y value, the horizontal value, and let's select Add Modifier. Now here, we just want this image layer to bounce up and down in an unpredictable way, but without too much variation. So again, we're talking unpredictably. So the best thing that we can do is add a modifier to all keyframes. That's an amount from function set to random. Now here, we want to make sure that this effect is subtle. We don't want there to be a dramatic difference, otherwise it's going to make it hard to watch. So let's start with a range very subtle of about 5. Let's reduce the granularity down to, say, 1. That should give us a very rapid bounce. 
And if we play this back as is, you'll see this, you'll see that the image is bouncing up and down. It makes it pretty tough to watch because of the severity of it. What we're going to do here is adjust it again just a little bit by adding in a new action, which will subtract from modifier. And again, we're going to cut our value in half by changing our subtraction to 2.5. With this done, it should soften that effect a little bit and give us an up and down motion. Now that still looks like it's a little too severe, so we're going to reduce this more. Let's change the range to 2, and then let's change our action of constant to be a subtraction of 0.5. That's going to give us a 0.5 variation, and if I play this back, that's a much more subtle vibration in the effect. Combined with the flicker, you can see how this is very much starting to look like a piece of film. Now there's one final component to make this convincing, and that is we need to add a scrolling look to our film grain so that it isn't just static in its appearance for the slide duration. One of the best ways to do this is to adjust its horizontal pan and make it appear that it's constantly scrolling downward. Here's how we can do this. If you right click on the pan Y value for layer number three and select add modifier, there's a particular function that does an excellent job of giving you a continuous scrolling look. Change your action type to apply to all keyframes, select amount from function, and this time choose a sawtooth wave. Now here's why you select a sawtooth. Notice that the value for the sawtooth wave increases to a certain value and then very abruptly changes back to the original value. If this is done quickly enough, your eye can't perceive the difference in that motion, so it looks as if it's a continually rolling motion. And that's exactly how the sawtooth wave is going to help us make it look as if this film grain is constantly changing. Now, to make this look truly convincing, we're going to need to adjust its frequency as well as its amplitude. On the frequency, let's start by adjusting this to 10. That gives us a nice, very, very high frequency. Now the problem that we're going to run into with a frequency set like this is that the amplitude may be a little bit too high, making it unpredictable. So what we can do here is begin by reducing the amplitude just a little bit using another keyframe or another action. So again, we can subtract and subtract a value of 25. That's going to drop that waveform to half of its setting, and that gives us a much more convincing up and down look to our film grain. There's one final component to making this effect work, and that is we're going to add some motion to the film grain to make it look as if those scratches are changing in location. So in the starting position, drag your film grain so that it's lined up on the left edge of the slide frame, and in the ending position, do the same to the right edge of the slide frame. That's going to give you a look of motion in combination with the film grain. Now we should have our completed effect. If we play this back, we can see the flicker, the look of the projector, and the movement of the film grain, giving us what an untrained eye might immediately think is a video, not a slideshow. And these are the kinds of advanced visual effects that modifiers allow you to create that would have been possible to do with keyframes, but incredibly difficult and incredibly time consuming. So remember that there are some very distinct and key benefits to working with modifiers. Modifiers allow you to work quickly to create effects like this one much faster than you would do if you were working with traditional keyframing. Modifiers allow you to completely avoid working with keyframes for most layers which gives you more flexibility for both automation and to correct or adjust the appearance of your effect without having a series of cascading changes that have to be made across your entire slide. You also have enormous amounts of power and the potential to create effects, again like this one, that would have been something you may not have even conceived of doing before modifiers were added to the program. Now finally, remember, modifiers can't do what keyframes can't do. If you cannot do something with keyframing, a modifier isn't going to give you the ability to do it. This effect that we've seen here can be done with keyframes. It would just be incredibly difficult and time consuming to do. Modifiers are incredibly powerful and are wonderful for augmenting shows, but it does not allow you to replace the design of your shows only with modifiers. So remember, 
Modifiers will make your shows easier to create, make your complicated effects far more simple and straightforward. They are incredibly valuable, but they do still have some limitations. Thanks very much for watching. If you'd like to see any more information about creating keyframes, working with captions, or working with masking, please take a look at our other workshop DVDs for more information.